Hi everyone, this week we're going to be focused on developing that rhetorical situation for your description essays and also drafting your description essays. So with the rough draft process, it's going to be the same as last time. You're turning in the rough draft with most of the paper done, as much of it as you can done, um, so you can get some feedback on that from a partner, and then you turn in the final draft next week. But before we can really get into fully drafting the entire paper, we want to make sure you've set up the rhetorical situation of the paper because your rhetorical situation is going to determine how you use ethos logos and pathos making sure you're using it correctly and being the most convincing that you can be to your reader as you write it so i'm going to use the working thesis that i created in the slides that you looked over last week and also side note if you need a review of a rhetorical situation uh, that's a bit more in depth than what i'm going to discuss go back into i believe it was week four Yes, go back into week four, and I have all the notes still in there for rhetorical situation. So going back to my thesis that I used in the slides last week, I said that banning books is an antiquated practice that's recently come to the public's eye again. One of the most famous banned books is Beloved by Toni Morrison. Readers of all backgrounds will clearly see that this book beautifully illuminates the uncomfortable truths of history. Now, the reason why I wanted to use this thesis particularly is this could easily go into an argument essay, but you don't want it to go into an argument essay. By the end of this essay, I would want to have given all of the descriptions and narratives and evidence as to why this book was banned and why banning this book um, hides those truths, those uncomfortable truths of history that Toni Morrison was trying to showcase and all the impacts that it had. I wouldn't actually delve into the argument that it should not have been banned or that book shouldn't be banned, period. So you want to give all those descriptions and give all the evidence to your reader and then just kind of throw the facts at them without making your argument. So your descriptive essay is just an informative essay where you give all the information, but you don't say, and now this is how you have to feel about it, or this is what the stance is, this is the argument. So you want to be really careful about not creating an argument here. And I'll show you how I did that within my outline as well here in a second when we get to it. So the first thing for my rhetorical situation, my audience is going to be readers, okay? And specifically, I focus on both students and teachers within um, all my descriptions that I'm choosing and within my outline, because readers, that could go from ages what five to whenever, okay? That's a really wide audience and it's too broad. So if, if I focus on readers as students and teachers, then I can focus on classroom and learning as readers, not just entertainment with readers. And so my purpose is to describe the book and why, or yeah, why it was banned and the impact. So again, I'm not gonna convince, my purpose isn't to convince people that this book shouldn't be banned, but it's to give them all that information, show them the importance of the topic, so then maybe they go read the book, okay? Context, remember your context is everything that is surrounding your topic that's going to influence how people see about it. Recently, the context with banned books is that there are a lot of schools that have banned the book Mouse, which is a graphic novel that portrays uh, concentration camps and the idea of Nazi Germany during those pieces, and it's been banned and is bringing back to light how within, you know, even in modern times, we still have a lot of books within schools and places that are trying to be banned. Beloved is one of them that's been banned. Um, Harry Potter is another one that's banned all the time, 1984, Fahrenheit 451. All of these are coming back into the news and you're seeing them across different TikToks and news channels um, explaining why they are banned and people arguing for and against. So I'm going to say my context is all these banned books being discussed again. And not only being discussed, but schools actually trying to ban them. So the importance of the topic is out there again. With my genre... Part of that genre is you're writing a descriptive essay. Okay, so it's descriptive and informative. Everybody's gonna have that portion of the genre. You are making extreme descriptions with that vivid, vivid language. You're being informative, not argumentative, but you also wanna go a bit more depth with the style. So for my kind of book where I'm talking about banning books and uh, those uncomfortable truths of history, I wanna make sure I'm being serious and that I'm showing all sides and perspectives if I can type. Okay. I want to make sure that I avoid humor because this is not the kind of topic where humor is going to help me. I might actually turn my audience against me if I start making jokes about it. Um, if I also, I have to avoid being too overdramatic or too emotional. If I make it into an essay where I'm just trying to force people to cry about my topic 
Again, they're probably going to turn away and not listen to me anymore. Think about all those times you've ever been in an argument with somebody and they kind of just turn the waterworks on and you just stop listening because you're annoyed. That's that same concept there. You want to balance the emotions that you're bringing in. So I might have some aspects with those uncomfortable truths. Yeah, some of those uncomfortable truths are sad. So I'm going to have elements of that within there. But I want to make sure I'm approaching it in a serious manner, in a serious genre. So think about your topics. Can you have humor in it? You absolutely, like humor is allowed in college writing, but does your topic and your audience lend to it? Because if I'm writing a paper for about COVID vaccines and testing, and I'm trying to convince people one way or the other, humor is not the way to go. It's not going to be convincing to my audience. But if I'm trying to convince somebody that they should download TikTok for all the amazing trends and apps on there, I can add humor into it. I can talk about the funny trends that go into it because it lends to my audience and it lends to my topic. So think about your audience and your purpose before you make those decisions about your genre, okay? Your medium and your occasion, you can't choose. Your medium is a typed essay in APA format, and your occasion is the due date. You also can't change that. So those two are done. So you really, your audience and your purpose, you should have determined in your thesis, and it's okay. Maybe you haven't written your thesis yet, or you're still working with it. Sometimes I write my rhetorical situation first, and then I write my thesis. It's just in this instance, I did my thesis first, and then I worked this way. Whichever way your brain works, do it that way that works best for you. But your rhetorical situation helps you f uh, hone in on that audience and purpose really well. So once you've determined your rhetorical situation, and obviously your context will probably be a bit more in depth than what I've typed here. I didn't want to type it all or the video could go on for quite a while, but this is all your research. It's all those subcategories that you need to make sure you're just choosing what has to go within your topic. Okay. So if I'm talking about, oh, my German shepherd snoring next to me. So I'm going to use him as an example. If I use German shepherds and their behaviors as my descriptive essay topic within there. Okay. Um, maybe I make sure that one of my subcategories is their sleep behaviors. And then I could go into their play behaviors. I could go into their eating behaviors. Um, I could go into their work behaviors. So as working dogs. So those subcategories, those are all the paragraphs you're creating. That's all the context you need to understand to convince your audience of your purpose within there. So sorry, going back to that, back on track. So rhetorical devices. So based on this, this is then how am I going to use ethos, pathos, logos based on my whole rhetorical situation. So remember your ethos is your evidence and your examples. Okay. So I know already some of my evidence examples, I'm going to talk about the story overall, beloved. Okay. I'm going to get, I know I'm going to have to give some kind of brief summary so people know what I'm talking about. Okay. I also want to, since students and teachers are my audience, I'm probably going to bring in some classroom descriptions so they can see how this impacts them in the classroom. How does banning books or not banning books impact learning or impact teaching within there? I also know I'm going to have to do some description, description examples of those historical events that she references. You can see that your professors can't type too as well. There we go. Okay. Um, examples of those historical Oh my goodness. There's historical truths that she brings up in the novels, uh, which is one of the reasons why the book was banned in the first place. So I'm going to have to bring up a lot of history, different examples. Um, I'm going to need to understand the book and different classroom descriptions. I also need to look into banning books and reasoning for my evidence. Okay. I should understand the laws that surround banning books, if there's any within there, or at least the legalities that come with that. And that's where you're going to basically delve into what kind of evidence do you need? For some of your topics, your evidence is your primary experience. So some of you have talked to me about your topic choices and you're choosing it because you have experience there and that's perfect. So some of your ethos is your own personal experience with that. It's your primary interaction with the topic. So for me, beloved, this is a book that I read for the first time when I was in middle school eons ago. And I've read it a multitude of times since. So part of my experience with it too is my primary experience as a reader with the book and my ability to describe my experiences reading it, uh, the characters I connect with, the standout quotes that I remember. I could even do a description of, uh, you know, the act of me reading it and remembering my first experiences reading it versus my experiences reading it. 
years later within there. Okay, So think about within that ethos, it doesn't just have to be the research that you're gaining. Here I've listed all the research that I would have to gain from those databases. So I helped develop some of those main words, those key phrases for my Boolean searching there. But I could also list personal experience in here too, that I then don't have to go back and go into databases for. Okay, so you want to find a balance within there. Your logos is your logic. Okay, this is that it makes sense. Okay, that how you're describing it, the descriptions you're choosing, it makes sense. Your audience isn't confused, but it's also that you're choosing the things that are the most persuasive or the most informative uh, for the audience within there. So one thing, logos decision I know I'm going to make since mouse is part of my context and why banning books is being discussed, I'm going to do a compare contrast paragraph with that book particularly. So I know explaining how mouse's influence right now has brought beloved back into public eye again as well. And that's why we're discussing it. I'm going to compare mouse to beloved for a little bit in a paragraph. So comparing and contrasting is one of those logos um, approaches that logic approach that you can use using examples is a logic approach you can use. Classifying things is a logic approach you can use. I think to your science classes, you classify pieces. So if you're talking about plants, and I am not a science person, so if I botch this, my apologies, but you're talking about plants, and then you may classify the types of plants. So trees, flowers, mosses, da 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 da. So you're classifying to help somebody understand a difficult concept. Uh, this is also used a lot in medical topics, again, a more science-based topic within there, um, you may have to give definitions, okay? If you have any difficult words, you may have to define that word or even define an experience. Um, so when I'm talking about the uncomfortable truths in this book, some of those uncomfortable truths, many of my readers aren't going to be able to empathize with and connect with because they've never experienced it. So I may need to define that experience and what it means that she's describing within there. You may also need to develop narratives, okay, when it comes to being logical and helping people understand pieces. Um, so one of the things we'll go to show you in a second, one of my paragraphs, I want to develop a narrative where I explain going into the classroom, what it's like having only certain books you can and cannot use within there. So I want to develop a narrative. Keep in mind, narratives are fantastic for formal essays, but I still want you to focus and be third person only. Okay. To make sure you're third person only in your writing so that, you know, avoiding saying I, you, us, we, our, my, um, you focus on your audience. The moment you say I in a paper, you've taken away almost any and all of your credibility because it's no longer a researched piece. You've no longer shown your logic and your ethos. You're purely showing pathos because you're showing it's just opinion now. You want to show, I have not just pathos, but I have logos and ethos to back myself up to. So just don't say I. Instead, you use your audience. And for mine, it's readers, students, and teachers. So instead of saying, I think this book was banned because of this, I'm going to say, teachers can attest to the fact that this book was banned because, da 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 here's my fact, my quote, and my in-text citation for it. So you talk to your audience you don't use I within there. And that helps make sure of it. But narratives specifically, very easily, when we start writing a narrative, we want to type I, or we want to type you, or our. So be careful when you write a narrative, just watch yourself when you're revising it to fix it within there. Okay, and then that last rhetorical device is your pathos, it's your emotions. Again, how I remember this one is that emotions are pathetic pathos. It's the easiest way for me to remember it. So this is what level of emotions you want to utilize and would be best to utilize in your paper based on your audience and purpose. And for me, my logos is also kind of going to connect with my pathos as well, because my narrative description is not only a logical decision, so it's easier for people to understand the classroom, it's also an emotional decision because I'm forcing the reader to take on the perspective of a student or a teacher and understand where they're coming from within there. So I know that's going to be one of my pathos decisions within it. I also know that when I'm using the historical examples, I want to make sure I'm showing multiple perspectives that my reader might not have empathized with before. 
So I'm going to help them see the different perspectives and the different empathy and those emotions they can feel for it so they can understand where I'm coming from in there. So this is that level of emotion you want to include. Always remember, ethos and logos are the most important. We're wanting to convince people and we're wanting to show them our lack of bias and our credibility. So we always need to have way more ethos and logos. Our pathos we should use like sprinkles. Okay, not glitter because glitter gets everywhere and we can't get rid of it. But we want sprinkles, whatever flavor of sprinkles you want. But we want sprinkles because you can see them, you can taste them, but they're not in every single bit of the ice cream sundae going through. Okay, so take a minute and I would pause the video right here and go through your rhetorical situation. Do your rhetorical situation on your own. Figure out your thesis, your audience purpose, context, genre. You already know your medium occasion. And then kind of brainstorm out your rhetorical device approach. What can you use within there? And again, remember, you may do situation first, then thesis. It's up to you. But pause here, do your brainstorm, and then continue on with me. So once you've done the brainstorm, now it's time to outline. Okay. And I always outline before I start researching. You can do it whichever way you prefer. But I just kind of want to walk you through how one writer does it. So you can take some advice from me or go, ooh, I don't like that loony. I'm never doing it that way. And that's fine. Okay. Whatever writing works best for you. But here's how I do it. So I outline first with all of my subcategories or my paragraphs that I need. So I know those topics that I have to research. And then once I get into researching, if I realize that there's more topics I didn't think of, I can add them into my outline later. But I at least need some sort of working outline that I have some place to go. Because if I don't even know what I'm researching yet, what am I supposed to type in the databases? So making a working outline for me helps me gear towards my research and what I want to do. Um, and this is also something on how I organize my outlines as well. I put my meal into my outline. Remember meal, main idea, evidence analysis link. So I can remember what I'm doing. So your intro, as per usual, you have your hook and your thesis, as always. My first paragraph, I wanted to make sure I immediately grabbed the attention and I wanted to start out with my narrative. So I put up top here next to my Roman numeral that this is what I want the paragraph to be about. Description of classrooms where novels are banned. <coughs> Excuse me. I know for this one, I don't need to do any research for it because I'm a teacher and I teach in areas where I've had to have banned books that I'm not allowed to do. Did I always listen to those rules? No. Um, but I'm a teacher and I have the experience. So I don't need to research evidence for this one. So I know for this one, I'm going to primarily just use my own example instead of evidence. So am I doing researched evidence or am I doing a primary source example that I can go with? So I'm still going to have that main idea topic sentence, evidence example, my analysis, my link. And don't forget with your main idea and your topic evidence or main idea and topic sentences, if you need help coming up with those transition words again, you can either go back into the modules or what I do when I'm in the middle of typing and I just can't think of anything, I will type in transition words. This top one, the or uh, hopefully it comes up top for you, I don't know. Uh, the writing to richmond.edu, I use this one all the time because again, it gives you what the paragraph would be about the purpose of the paragraph. So is it meant to emphasize, uh, give an example, consequence or result? This would be for like your rebuttal or something like that. All of these work really well. It gives you the type and then it gives me examples of transitions. I love this if I can't think of something on the top of my head. It gives me different ideas. So go there to help you with that. And then I do that for the rest of it. So this is the same outline I had in the notes from last week. I just wanted to sort of show you again how I organized it. And then I could figure out based on each one whether I needed to actually do research or use primary experience. So the third paragraph, Toni Morrison's experiences that led her to becoming an author. I don't know Toni Morrison. Or, uh, I never knew her because uh, she has passed away. Um, I didn't know her personally, so I cannot use primary examples. I need to do actual research. I can't just use an example. I need to do research on this one. Okay. Um, a brief summary of the novel. I've read the novel. I'm going to write the summary. But remember... Even though I've read the novel, I didn't write it, so I still have to cite my summary, okay, because my main piece is still an outside piece within there. Uh, the time period the novel focuses on, I'll definitely utilize the novel as a piece of evidence, and I'm also going to use some outside research too so I can understand that time period, because I wasn't alive during that time period the novel focuses on. Uh, this section, I do this a lot too, 
So I wanted to talk about those historical connections, the truths that she talks about in the novel. I think I could probably make this into two or three paragraphs and focus on two or three historical connections, but I'm not sure what I want to do yet. So I'm going to put it there and then make myself a side note. I might expand this into two or three. Depends what I find when I start researching. Uh, the differing perspectives the novel provides, again, sort of a combo between the novel and also outside research. Why the novel was banned, I'm going to have to do outside research for that one. And my final paragraph before my conclusion, the description of the classroom, the free novel choices, that's my personal experience. That will be a narrative and I don't need to do research. And then finally, the conclusion. And so this right here is how I also always set up my conclusions, sort of a bullet point fill in the blank, and then you kind of smush it together and add transitions where you need to. That first sentence, restate your thesis, make sure your audience is focused on it, about one sentence. Give yourself a summary of the main ideas of the entire essay, about two to three sentences. Do not go overboard, okay, with that summary here. What I notice a lot in early writers is you try to summarize every single paragraph into a main idea. Not every single paragraph is a main idea, okay, when you're writing this. You have some paragraphs that are much larger, more important ideas, and that's what would go in your conclusion. So you need to make that decision as a writer. What are those main, main ideas that you need to remind your reader of in your conclusion? And then the final couple sentences in your conclusion are what I call those mic drop moments, where you kind of just throw the mic in their face and go, mm, I'm done, eh. Okay. So that's where you're going to focus on your purpose or the so what of the topic. So why should I read this paper in the first place? Why does this paper matter? Eh, I'm just going to throw it away afterward. No, you don't want that. You want by the end of the paper for your reader to go, oh my gosh, I totally get the purpose. I get what I'm supposed to do. Lay it out for them. Okay. <coughs> Help them direct them where you want them to go with it. Okay. So I wanted you to see how I brainstorm when it comes to it. And then I think this is going to help you stay on track too with your research and figuring out your main ideas and your keywords, all those pieces. I'm going to put um, the link for this document on the module for this week so you can kind of see it. Maybe you can take the outline process. If you like this outline process, it's up to you, um, but that will be there for you. So the rest of this week is focused on drafting those rough drafts, asking me any questions, and developing your rhetorical situations. So you're going to retur return, I can't talk, you're going to turn in your rhetorical situation and uh, rhetorical device brainstorms into the discussion so I can see where you're going, what kind of track you're on, and then working on the outlines and pieces like that. And obviously, if you need anything from me, you can email me and I will help you with anything. Or if you need help brainstorming, I'm also there for that. So let me know what you need. And you guys have a wonderful day and be some wonderful writers.